Um, grab your Bibles. Uh, today's message is, is interesting. It's a little different. I'm just going to tell you that up front. Um, if you're looking for uh, deep theological stuff, probably won't happen today. Uh, I want to wrap up uh, what we've been talking about as it relates to naked and not ashamed. But before I do that, let me just give you a little heads up on what's going to be happening in August. Um, in August, I'm going to be switching to a series where I want to help us all understand who we are in Christ. Okay? So, um, Meaning, I want to address the issue of identity because if you look at culture, it's shifting and culture is redefining what I, you know, who we are. But I don't know about you, but I know who I am in Christ. Do you know who you are? Come on, come on. Come on, repeat out of me. Say, I know who I am. Now say it like you mean it. Say, I know who I am. Say, I am. And if you're, if you're male, say son. If you're female, say daughter. Okay, say, I am a daughter or son of Christ. Amen. Now, there you go, there you go. Don't be saying son or daughter. Know who you are. Okay, your identity. <laughs> That's why we're doing this series. Okay, know, know who you are because some folk don't know who they are in there and culture is defining them. So one more time, say, I am a son or daughter of Christ. Go for it. Yes. Amen. So we'll be talking about that beginning August. Um, we were supposed to have a nice promo to present to you. Um, I'll own that and so I kind of blew that because I didn't get the script in time to our technical team or production team so they can put that all together. But I just want to give you a plug on that. I'm, I'm excited about it. And the reason for my excitement is not so much for you, even though it is, but it's really in my personal life that I am continuing to grow in Christ. You know, when Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I understood and behaved like a child, but then I became a man, I put away childish things. Um, don't make the mistake of thinking that it was just all of a sudden infancy, and then the next thing is maturity where he's in the manhood. There's a process in between that, and there are progressive stages in between them. I think in my own spiritual journey, I am continuing to progress in Christ. So I'm at a place now where if I don't define who I am, the enemy will. You kind of get this? If you don't know who you are, the enemy will define it for you. So we're going to go on this quest and this search for identity and talk through that. I'm very, very excited about what God's going to say there. Amen? Today we're going to finish up um, um, Naked and Not Ashamed. Pastor Derek did a piece last week on blended families. I was hoping to have a person to do um, single or living the single life. That didn't work out quite as well as I wanted, but it's okay. I just wanted to add this piece of information on the back end. I was sharing with First Service that Pastor Katani is supposed to be doing today with me, but our grandkids are in town. Um, we're excited to have them, and she gets to be grandma, and I get to be grandpa sometimes. Yeah, you know. <laughs> They're with us for 45 days. That's, no, no, it'll be all right, nothing. Yeah. No, you better stop that. Yeah, amen. That's a long time, y'all. Amen. When you, you used to being by yourself, just you and your wife, and wake up in the morning and do whatever you want to do. House is quiet, and you wake up first thing, 6 o'clock, the TV's going. No. No, I must be crazy. I love my kids, one. But <laughs> pray for us. We're enjoying the little jokers. They're having a great time, and it's just great to have them. Our kids live in um, Maryland, and so we don't get to see the kids as much. So in summer, we're trying to get them to come to Denver because we're hoping that when we grow old, they take care of us. So got to have a plan, y'all. Come on, y'all. <laughs> Remember, I let you come to my house? Yeah. yeah. So pray with us. Um, we're getting ready to go into word. Bow your heads with me. We're going to pray and we're going to talk through this. Lord, we thank you for you. We pray that you would just give us, um, grace us again with your presence, Lord. I want to be clear. I want to speak to our congregation so we can hear and learn and be who you would have us to be. So open our hearts to receive, Lord. We love you. Uh, thank you for the richness of your word, God. Let us apply the principles to our lives to be about you. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. So funny. Um, this is not part of the message. After the service on Sunday, one of our seniors came up to me, and she said to me, Hey, Pastor Felix, that's a great word. Problem with your message, it's 50 years too late. You know, <laughs> did y'all get it? Yeah, she's like, I ain't going back. I ain't getting married. I'm past all that. So I said, wow, that is interesting. But I want us, we've been talking for the past two months on the issue of Cain and, I mean, um, Adam and Eve. We've studied that story. We've studied the whole issue of naked and not ashamed. We've studied um, how these individuals found themselves in the best predicament that they could potentially be in. 
They lived life in the presence of God. They were in the Garden of Eden. They were close to God. They had it made as the term that I use. I mean, no rent, no cable bill, no car note. They, they had it all made. I mean, food galore. I said it this way, Adam could just look at the ground and it would produce, right? He just was blessed tremendously, um, him and Eve, how they started their life out. And if ever they were a picture of the perfect couple living the perfect life in the perfect, perfect environment, it would be Adam and Eve. Come on, say amen if you believe that. They had it made. They had it made. They had it made. They had it made. And the thing that strikes me about the story and the thing that pressed us, um, Pastor Tanya and I, to want to deal with this series, Naked and Unashamed, is just how Adam and Eve handled the situation that they found themselves in without them doing what you and I would normally do today. And that's where I want to put on the back end of, of this, this message. Let me tell you what was happening here. Here's what was going on. Here's Adam and here is Eve in their home, living life, waking up every morning, hanging out with God, talking with God, enjoying the presence of God, don't have a care in the world, if I could use that term, just happy and living life. Then all of a sudden, one day, the serpent comes and he approaches their home and he approaches Eve and he engages Eve in dialogue, and then he gets Eve to do two things that are extremely critical. Number one, he got Eve to disobey God, and then secondly, I don't know if you knew this, but then he also caused her to disobey her husband. Come on, y'all, you're probably wondering why is that, preacher? Well, understand with me, if you read Genesis chapter two, before Eve came on the scene, Adam was the one who received the instruction that you're free to eat from every tree in the garden, but the tree that's in the middle of the garden, you shall not eat of it, for the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So you have to imagine when Eve came on the scene, if I'm Adam, I'm saying to my wife, hey, baby, first of all, all this is ours. I mean, all of it, except that one thing over there. God said, I'm going to begin with God said, but then I'm also going to say, don't mess it up for me. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Y'all quit, quit being holy on me. You know you say the same thing. Don't, don't touch that tree. Don't eat of it. Don't, don't mess it up for me. So, so she heard what God said, but I'm also very confident that because she wasn't there, Adam was instructed to issue the command to remind her of the word of God. So my conclusion is she disobeyed God, and secondly, she disobeyed her husband. Now here, here's what happens, here's what happened. God comes on the scene because Eve partakes of this fruit. She then eats it, she gives it to her husband. He eats, eats with her. Then the Bible says the eyes of both of them were open. They saw their nakedness, they were ashamed, and they went and hid. God comes on the scene, and then God now confronts Adam. He says, Adam, where are you? Here's Adam's response. Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I went and hid because I was naked. Being the God that he is, God says to Adam, Adam, who, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit that I told you not to eat? I love Adam's response. The woman. <laughs> I love it. The woman. If you hadn't hooked me up, I'd have been good still. That woman you gave me, he said, she gave me and I ate. Then God goes to the woman, he goes to Eve, and he says, Eve, what is this that you have done? And then Eve says that the serpent beguiled me, the serpent deceived me, the serpent tricked me, and I ate. And you all know the story. God deals with the serpent. He deals with Eve, and then he deals with Adam. And I really want to process this because this is where my mind gets boggled. Here's what happens in God dealing with them. He sentenced them. He, 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 he punishes them. He renounces a curse on the earth and a curse on the serpent. And Adam and Eve end up suffering the consequences of their sin. But the depth of what happened here that blows my mind, that just has me thinking that I approach Pastor Katani with this. She messed up and they lost their house. They did. They got kicked out the garden. Y'all know the story. Come on, come on. They got evicted, and my terms, 
they end up homeless because of what just happened and lock into this. When God puts them out the garden, Adam just grabs Eve by the hand and they both walk out the garden. Not one argument. Y'all don't look at me funny. Because if your husband come home and tells you, we just lost our house, or we just lost our job, and I just lost it because it's your fault. This, this, this ain't going pretty, guys. <laughs> All right? This is not going to end pretty. Come on, y'all. I am talking escalation beyond measure. Woman, look at what you did. See what you made happen? We had it made. Now all of a sudden, we got to move to East Colfax. We were, I mean, we had, I want y'all to get this. But yet and still, yet and still, yet and still, they left the garden and there is no record of any escalation or argument between the two. And I'm confused because I've been married 37 years. And I better not mess up. Are you with me? It ain't going to be no, it's okay, honey, come on. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And, and, I, and, and I'm comfortable saying in your relationship, it ain't going to be no, it's okay, honey. No, no, I don't care if God did it or not. It's going to see what you made God do. And, <laughs> and it's going <laughs> to, come on, y'all, it's going to get ugly from there. So my question is, what was it? What was it? What was it about these two individuals that caused them to go through the worst crisis in their life? Losing their home, losing their place of residence, losing, come on, I mean, just being thrown out from the presence of God, even though God still came with them. I get all that, I get all that. But that's not something you walk through peacefully. Come on, say amen. It's not something you go through. What was it about them, about these two individuals that caused them to be who they would have them to be? So there's some things that I want to talk you through, and I'm going to move quick, um, so, so pay close attention as you walk through. The first thing is this. I want to begin by saying, and this, where this statement comes from so you could know, it's not something I adopt, adopted from anyone. I was reviewing um, the work that I did for my doctoral thesis, and in reviewing that this week, this, st this statement came to mind because I believe in the depths of it, it summarizes the message I'm trying to communicate in that thesis work. Here's what it says. The world we live in is the world we've, that should be a D, we've created based on our interpretation of life's experiences. I'll explain. The world I live in is the world that I have created based on how I interpret what I experience in life. Let me, let me say it differently. The relationship you're in, good, bad, or indifferent, or where we find ourselves in life, is the result of the experiences that we've had that shape, that form us, and we live our life based on what happened in yesterday. You kind of get what I'm saying? Let me illustrate, let me illustrate. Check with Adam and Eve and ask them if a serpent will ever get her to eat another fruit. You kind of get what I'm saying? So she created a world where serpents don't speak to her anymore. Yeah, <laughs> you kind of get it. And that's the world that she lives in. So here's what I want to say to you as you walk through this. Number one, it's very, very important as we go through the message today that I want you to hear me say and understand with me that you can change your world. Amen. Repeat out of me. Say, self, I can change my world. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you can change your world. Tell your other neighbor, say, other neighbor, you can change your world. And let me walk through this and if you've been at Restoration any length of time, you're probably sick of seeing uh, this formula on the screen. This was a formula when I was doing my doctoral work, my, my uh, dissertation. Here's what the word, the formula says. Change, which is C, can happen in any, I used it when I was doing this, we were talking about organizational systems. There's connection now to relationship. Change can happen in any home, in any relationship, if dissatisfaction exists, 
as long as there is a clearly defined vision, clearly articulated first steps, that's what the F means, and the greater than R simply means that must all be greater than resistance. Here's what it means. It takes two people to work together to change the relationship. Come on, talk to me, y'all. If one is willing and the other isn't, it's extremely difficult because resistance is coming from some place. But if resistance is lower, change can happen in any relationship, in any world, in any home. So here's what that means. I can change my world assuming I am dissatisfied with the way things are right now. I can change it. Let's walk through, through this and get to where we need to go. So here's what dissatisfaction means. Dissatisfaction now exists in relationship when one partner loses interest in the way the relationship is going and they then become interested in finding ways to improve their situation, okay? So here's what happens. You're in a relationship, you're in a situation, and then here's D. I am dissatisfied because I don't like the way it looks, I don't like the way it goes, and here's what we do. We go try how to fix it so we can feel well and eliminate the dissatisfaction that we are experiencing. Here's what you need to know about dissatisfaction. The root cause now of dissatisfaction, it lies in the concept of what is known as first and second order realities. I'm gonna explain because I want you to get this carefully. Come on, say first order reality. Say second order reality. If you've been here any length of time as a member of Restoration, we spoke about this concept a couple of years ago, especially when I was doing the research on the subject. So the root cause of dissatisfaction lies now in this thing that's called first order and second order reality. That's the beginning of the deterioration of any relational or relationships, okay? So here's what this looks like. And here's what that means. Let's kind of walk through this. So first order realities are composed of uninterpreted facts and data that are accessible, measurable, or empirically verifiable. Don't get hung up on the terms. I'm going to break it down and explain. What first order reality speaks of, let me, let me, let me give you another example and give some illustration, okay? First order reality is the truth as spoken by the speaker. Okay, so here, here's an example. That word move should be make. I was in a hurry. So I say to Katani, can you make some steak for dinner? That's the first order reality because I spoke it. I said it. It is my desire. Does that make sense? Okay, first order reality. So here's another one. Um, she could say to me, ask me a question, where you been all day? Here is my first order reality response. I was at the movie, movie hopping all day. The men are like, cool. The women are already saying, sure. <laughs> come on, y'all. You see how they, you kind of get where this is going. And you see how this works. So I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that in a little while. And we kind of talk about this in a little while. So here's the thing. Second order realities now are not in the facts or data or the situation or the statement itself, but it is in the interpretation put there by the observers, including their opinion, their judgment, their assessment, their evaluation, and their varying account. So watch this. Second order reality is not in what was spoken, but listen to this. It exists in the mind of the interpreter. Right? Let, let me help y'all with this. Where you been all day? I was at the movies. First order reality says I was at the movie. Second order reality says this. The person who heard is starting to form their own opinion, interpretation on what was said. Oh, come on, y'all. Say amen. I, I know this is making sense. I know you're getting this. So let me, I'm gonna give you some, let me talk about give you some examples. Second order realities creates a reality. It creates a reality based upon a person's perception of the first order reality and are constructed by the person who holds them. True example. Katani and I were home yesterday and she was washing and the washing machine wouldn't drain. 
and she said, first order reality. Hey, Felix, come here. Help me with the washing machine. I'm in my office, and I'm preparing a message for the day, and I'm processing and thinking. So I heard what she said, right? I started to attach meaning to what she said. You kind of get where I'm going. So I heard it. I'm in my office. I'm processing, but I have things to do. <laughs> Let me finish this paragraph. Let me finish what I'm doing. Let me work what I'm doing. It's not that important. Washing machine, show ain't going nowhere. <laughs> you kind of get this. And I'm adding all this meaning. So by the time I come, my interpretation of Felix come here does not align with the first order reality of what Felix come here meant. So here's what I had. I created a world that was filled with attitude. Forget the state. <laughs> you guys see how this works, right? You kind of get what I'm saying? And there's a bumping of heads because we attach meaning, and here's what, what it did. It contributed to dissatisfaction, and I had to pray all night long. <laughs> because I created an environment. Come on, does this make Are you guys getting this? I created an environment in my home. So here's, here's what it looked like. So, so remember I said that, that with this second order reality, you create stuff and you attach meaning. So here's what it says. Can you make some steak for dinner, right? Where you been all day? I was movie hopping. Now lock into this. If there was presuppositions and preconceptions and other things going on in the mind of the person asking, they attach meaning to the question and they hear something completely different irregardless of what was intended when it was first spoken. Let me help y'all with this. Let me help y'all. I'm, I'm almost there. Here, here's a, what I call the ladder of inference, right? And here is how all this forms and here's how all this creates and here's how all this gets to where it is. I'll read it. I'll read it for you, so don't worry about it. It's the ladder starts on the bottom because you don't climb a ladder from the top. You climb it from the bottom going up. So observable data. Where you been all day? I've been at the movies, okay? So you heard the first thought of reality. I was at the movie. So number two, six says, I select data from what I heard. If it was, make me some steak for dinner, please. I hear, make and I hear dinner, and I choose not to hear steak, okay? Now, I might have my reason for choosing not to hear steak. It could very well be there's no steak in the house. It could be I just got my hair done, and I don't want smoke in my hair. It could be a whole lot of things, but the first order reality was I want steak, and if you produce chicken from the question, you see what can happen. Come on, y'all talk to me. You see what can happen, right? So, so it says here, I add meaning. I love this. I love cultural and personal experience to the equation. And look at number four. I make assumptions based on the meaning I added. I like that. Number three, I draw conclusions. Number two, I adopt belief now based on the world. And then number one says, when I get to the top of the ladder, I take action based on everything I've created. Let me help you out with this. Where you been all day? I was at the movies. I could be sincere. I could be genuine. Here's the second order reality. Four years ago, when he told me he was at the movies, movie wasn't even playing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You were at the movies? I was at the movies. Show me the stub. Show me the popcorn bucket. What movie did you see? You, you, you guys get where I'm going. Because now, because of past hurts, because of past wounds, because of past failures, because of past things, the person creates a world based on what they heard, and they start to live in the world that they created. My gosh, I'm hoping you can see. Some of y'all are like, that's not like you. you know? <laughs> based on where we've been. Does this make sense to you all? You kind of get what I'm saying? 
and we start to live in the situation, and it puts us in a bad place, and we shouldn't be here. So here's the question I want to ask. Why then do people create these second-order realities that develop into dissatisfaction? Why can't I just take you at face value and you can't take me at face value for what I said? Why is it that I have to bring my world into the equation to interpret what you said when what you said could very well be truth for whatever it's worth, right? Here is where I land, and this is what I want us to get. Because of the absence of trust. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Because of the absence of trust. If I don't trust you, the likelihood of you doing anything right, I don't care who you are, is very difficult. I don't care how truthful you are in what you communicate, because of trust, I am going to hear everything through the filters of either your past failing or my wounds and or experiences. Does this make sense, guys? And we bring that stuff into our relationship. So I want to take you to a simple, quick process, and I don't have time to deal with this. We'll flesh this out more on Wednesday, so I invite you to come. Let's talk about it a little bit. I want you to build, to, to establish cohesion in your relationship when we talk about that. If trust does not exist, hear me say this, the genuineness, the authenticity of the relationship is questioned from Jump Street. Y'all are quiet. Are you hearing me? If trust does not exist, me going into the thing, the likelihood of it succeeding is extremely difficult because someone or both partners are apprehensive of each other and to try to make any forward progress, you're simply fooling yourself and you'll find yourself on that wheel going through the motions over and over and over and over again and not making any progress in the relationship. Does this make sense? Let me, let me tell you how this plays itself out. Look at the second one, right? Conflict. Here's what conflict looks like. The purpose of conflict is to allow the other person an opportunity to be heard. And because if everyone is here, heard, they can go to the next place. So here's what it looks like. Where you been? I was at the movies. I don't trust you. What do you mean you don't trust me? Because last time you told me you were going to the movies, you really weren't at the movies. Girl, that was 10 years ago. I don't care how long it's been. Come on, y'all. Come on. And it has nothing to do with whether he or she is at the movie. A red car passed by that looked like the last red car. I wish I had somebody in here. And all of a sudden, you've placed yourself in places where you shouldn't be. And watch the conflict. It keeps escalating and building and growing and growing. And you're arguing back and forth without any progress because the conflict is unhealthy because trust does not exist. I told you I wanted steak. Well, all we got is chicken. But I don't want no chicken. I want steak. If trust was there, you kind of get where I'm going. And the simplest things are heard through crazy filters, and they end up in unhealthy conflict. And I'm standing before you to say to you, the reason for the unhealthy conflict is because trust has been violated or it's not healthy, we have not properly dealt with trust. Does that make sense? The conflict isn't healthy, it's not there, and here's the next, next thing. We can't get to commitment. So here's what that means. I'm in the relationship and I really can't commit because I'm always checking your phone. I'm always looking for this. I'm always looking for reasons to fail. I'm always looking for something to be bad. So here's what happens. The D word is thrown, and I'm not talking about dissatisfaction. It's released in the air because I don't trust you. Conflict isn't healthy. I can't commit to this. 
Love you, see you, bye. Psh, we go our separate ways. Here's the next thing. Come on, y'all. Accountability. Don't ask me nothing. Don't hold me accountable because you're trying to hold me accountable for stuff that you're not willing to be held accountable for. So here's the thing. Anything on the accountability realm, are you going to come help me fix the washing machine that broke? You kind of get what I'm saying? If trust is not there, can't you wait? I'll get to it when I want to. Well, you don't love me because if you love me, you'd have been here right now. What do you mean I don't love you? I know you don't. You kind of get where I'm going. And then you're back on the cycle, the conflict, the commitments. Is, so the washing machine, that's not, this is not our problem. I'm just illustrating, all right? So y'all leave that alone. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's, it's the commitment isn't there. It never gets done because I'm going to spite you because you ticked me off at the accountability level. So I'm going to get even. It's going to get fixed. Don't worry about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? And then, and then look at this one. Look at this one. Look at this one. I'm almost there. And then you can never get to results. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Familial results, marital results, relational results, you can't get to it because it's broken way down here. Right? It's broken at the trust level. So here's what we do. We, we get spiritual at the result stage. Lord, fix my marriage. Lord, fix my relationship. Lord, fix all that at the result level. And I'm standing before you to say to you, up here will never get fixed if the foundation is broken. Come on, y'all. Hear me. It'll never get fixed up here if the relationship or the foundation is broken. We will never get to results. Okay? So let me hurry through this because I want to keep you long. Look at this. this, this is, I, I use this to illustrate Adam and Eve. So the question was, what in the world, what in the world caused Adam and Eve to lose their home, to lose their place of residence, and he can grab Eve's hand and they can walk out like nothing. It's okay, babe. We're just going to start over and we're going to do it all again. The reason they can do that, because trust at the foundation and the core of the relationship was healthy. Nothing was broken there. Even though Eve blew it, Adam acknowledged his wrong in the situation. God dealt with all of them. And because trust wasn't violated, watch this, when God engaged them in conflict, they took it and they owned it because they knew trust was not violated. And look at the next step. They can commit to each other because trust is healthy. They can hold each other accountable because trust is healthy. They can get to familial results. They can live life together even though they're outside of the garden because trust was healthy. Come on, does this make sense? The importance of having trust in your relationship as a foundational point. So here's a couple of things I want to say to you. Then we're going to wrap this up. Once again, the world we live in is the world we've created based on our interpretation of life experiences. So where I am in life right now is predicated on the world that I create, how I interpret my first order reality. So here's what I need to do. When Pastor Gatani says, hey, Felix, come here. The washing machine is broken. I can stay there and attach all kind of second order realities to it and allow dissatisfaction to get in my home, or I can hit save on my computer, get my behind out the seat, and go see what my Eve wants. You kind of get where I'm going. You get what I'm saying? Because if I don't and I stay here and allow dissatisfaction to happen, don't try to say, God, fix her. She's having a problem when I am the one creating the world. And the other way around. Not just the men only, the women too. Come on, you can, does this make sense? The world we live in is the world we've created based on how we interpret things. This is very, very important because here's a statement. You can change the world. You can change the world, right? You can change it. So look at the thing. Here's the formula again. Change can happen if dissatisfaction exists, clearly defined vision. Now notice the F has got some color on it. It's kind of red or an orangey color. That's first steps. What should I do 
to address dissatisfaction, right? What should I do to begin the process? And I'm done. First steps to establish cohesion in your relationship. Number one, by you must address any issue of trust that may exist. Listen to this. Make all relationship type decisions at the trust level. What do you mean, preacher? Girl, I met this dude. He got money. He got a car. He got a nice home. A couple of shady things about him, but I can live with that. Don't fool yourself. If you see flags, go to the hardware store and buy flag, flag poles to hang the flags on, okay? They are there for a reason. Oh, come on, talk to me. They are there for a uh, Come on, y'all. They are there for a reason. I, I kind of say it this way. There's nothing worse than doing premarital counseling with a couple where one of the individuals had maybe an addictive problem or some situation. And you want to say to them, did you know he was addicted before you married him? And he or she would say, yeah, I knew they were addicted, but I loved them. And I think that once we get married, it will stop. Keep waiting. Address it at the trust level. Come on, does that make sense? Address it at the trust. So Lockheed says, number two, spend time addressing issues with trust prior to being involved in any relationship. Let me help y'all. I can't get no more clear on it. You dating him, he dating you, and you see stuff that raises this flag. Here's what you say. Hey, dude, I love you, but I see a flag, and that thing is causing me to create some stuff from what I just got out of. So I don't know if I trust yet. Let's talk about this. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't, don't subdue it. Don't cover it up. Address it up front because if the foundation is not well, the house will not stand. And you wonder why the divorce rate is so high in the church and in Christianity and in the world? It's because people are just covering over issues of trust, thinking it's going to be okay as they go along then all of a sudden you can't stand it no more and you've created a world and he or she does not exist in the world you created. And here's what you say, one of us got to go. Since it's my house, it ain't me. <laughs> Y'all know how this works, right? Address it at the trust level. And here's what I said, if it's broken, please hear me say this, do not commit if it's broken, do not commit unless you're already in the relationship. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Come on. Is that if I'm married to you and you're married to me and we're start seeing flag, invest the time to work it out. Come on, y'all. Come on. Talk to me this morning. Ask the hard question. Ask the difficult question. Go through what you got to go through to get it well. You heard Pastor Katani and I share with you all throughout the entire series, 16 years of just a living hell. We had to get to the place where we sat down and addressed the issue of distrust that existed in the relationship or else we were never going to make it anywhere. And now, now that we've got good trust, I think I'm the happier for it. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I think, I think, I think, uh, here's what it looks like. We, we at home and, and, you know, watching sports and she likes basketball. Y'all remember Carl Malone? Y'all might be too young for that. Oh, she loved Carl. That was, those were the best days of my marriage. Yeah. Um, Cause she'd be like, Carl be like, mm, mm, mm. Lord have mercy. And I'm like, <laughs> but I wasn't worried about it cause I knew I trust her. Are you with me? Then we turn the TV off and she says, pretend I'm your call, baby. You know? <laughs> worried about it. Are you with me? Come on. Does that make sense? Because this trust does not exist. We can go on vacation together and see an attractive woman or beautiful person, and I can say to her, look at how good that person looked. My mind is pure. My motive is pure. She's not worried because trust has been fixed. Don't try this if trust isn't fixed. You're about to get her backhand or something. <laughs> I'm telling you, you're going to get hit. Don't try it. <laughs> don't try it. If you trust a shady, don't try it. You just watch the game and go like that. <laughs> don't 
never try. Don't say nothing. Don't do nothing. Get trust first. Very, very important. Adam and Eve trusted each other, right? And you might be saying, once again, you can change your word, right? You might be saying, how do you do that? Here, here, here's my prime example, and I'm going to stop at this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 puts it this way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And paraphrase, you're going to get to results. Right? I like verse 7. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Here's what that looks like for me. I trust God. Come on, come on, come on, y'all. I trust God. He's never failed me. He's never hurt me. He's never turned his back on me. In the words of David, I was young, now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or to see his seed begging bread. God has always been faithful to me. I have been the one that have blown it. Come on, I want y'all to hear me. I've been the one that have failed him, but because he continually loves me in spite of me, I have a trust for him that's unshakable and unmovable. So here's what that means. When I blow it and he comes to me in conflict to adjust me, to correct me, to mold me, to make me. I don't argue from a posture of anger. It might not feel good unless that God is hurt, but because I trust him, I can handle the conflict to get to commitment. And I can continually commit to him. And because I'm committed to him, he has all rights to hold me accountable. And he does a good job because here's what he did. He took his Holy Spirit and he placed him in me to remind me of whose I am. And I am confident of the results that one day I get to live in glory with him. See how this works? But if I don't trust God, I can't go nowhere with him. I can't get to results because trust is messed up. But I trust him. And I know he trusts me because he knows he can fix me when I blow it. <sighs> if you want to get to pure honesty and transparency, in your relationships, marital, familial, friendship, whatever, with God, make sure trust at the core is correct and watch what God's going to do. Bow your heads with me. Here's what I want you to do. I want every person in here just to evaluate yourself. I don't know where you are in your walk, on your continuum, on your journey, where you might find yourself, whatever it is you're going through. I want to say to you today that God loves you, God cares. God wants to restore you to a relationship with him. Just like how Adam and Eve blew it and God went and got them to bring them back to a relationship with him, he's doing the same. He's doing the same. That's the kind of God we serve. And maybe you're in a broken home, broken relationship. Maybe you're in a relationship right now. You're saying, man, preacher, what do I do about this? Put in the work at the trust level, but you can't do that unless God is first involved. Bring God to the home. Bring God to the home. So here's what I want to invite you to pray this morning. Say, Lord, work on me. Make me whole. Restore me. Fix me so I can love unconditionally like you love. Love. Ask him to do that. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. It's a ministry comp team comes, and let me just pray, then Pastor Karen's going to come. Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you're gracious. Lord, you're holy. You're merciful. Thank you for the richness of your word, God. Thank you for what we're learning. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you are. Continue to mold, continue to make, form us, God. Thank you for trusting Availing yourself. Proverbs 3. We refuse to lean on our own understanding, but acknowledge you in everything we do so you can make our path straight. I pray for marriages. I pray for divorced individuals. I pray for widows and widowers. I pray for every single person that's here. That they not just hear this word through the lens of past failures, but through the lens of hope, it's going to be better tomorrow. It's going to be different tomorrow. I can change 
my world. Thank you for what you're doing, God. Now, should there be one here that have not said yes to you? Should there be a person that have not given their life to you as personal Lord and Savior? Holy Spirit, draw them. Bring them to a relationship. Let them say, I want to know God. Maybe they have issues with you, God. Let them see that you care and you love them. Bring them to a relationship with you. Bring them, God. Bring them, bring them. We give our time to you. We give our hearts to you. Thank you for what you're doing. You're a wonderful and gracious God. Bless, Lord, in your name we pray.